from Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American Original. For over two decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. There's a world of investment opportunities out there. Spotting them takes experts on the ground, assessing potential firsthand. Templeton, a pioneer in global investing for over 50 years. Gain from our perspective. When you meet our people, understand their vision, the spirit of self-reliance, and legendary can-do attitude. It won't surprise you that so many world-class companies are proud to call Mississippi home. Visit Mississippi.org to see what we can do for you. Issue one, tough love. There are times where I've got some differences with unions on some issues. Uh, but that's, those are arguments among friends. I love teachers' unions. I've been supportive of them ever since I got into politics. Well, and, love or not, you know, Mr. Obama now critiques the unions. We are making the president is quitting the long-standing democratic tradition of close relations with teachers and their unions. That bucking was abundantly reinforced four months ago when the president congratulated a Rhode Island local parental school board for having fired all the school teachers from one school. All 93 school teachers terminated and all unionized. If a school continues to fail its students year after year after year, if it doesn't show any sign of improvement, then there's got to be a sense of accountability. And that's what happened in Rhode Island. The president also supports pegging teachers' salaries and teachers' jobs to how students perform on standardized tests. Teachers' unions say that such standardized tests are blatantly anti-teacher. How do you look in the face of a PE teacher, a history teacher, or a cafeteria worker and say, the reason you don't have a job is because our fourth graders, compared to last year's fourth graders, didn't do well on a math and reading test? Besides the NEA president, there's the veteran and noted education policy scholar, Diane Ravitch. She says, quote, The Obama team has decided to use the teachers' unions as a foil. They're not only willing to take on teachers' unions, but to hold teachers uniquely responsible for low test scores. Over the past several years, American students have lagged behind their international counterparts in math, in science, and in reading. Get this, among the top 30 most industrialized nations, the U.S. ranks 15th in reading, 21st in science, and 25th in math. Question, America spends $543 billion annually on public schools. Given that level of expenditure, why don't we get better results? Chris Starwell. Welcome, Chris. Well, Thanks for filling in for the vacationing part. Absolutely, absolutely. The teachers are stuck. Uh, you have, on the one hand, uh, labor unions that uh, uh, make their jobs about job security uh, and not about performance. It keeps them from being professionals. And then, on the other hand, you have parents who uh, demand that their children be treated like princes and princesses. Uh, you have a litigious environment where teachers aren't able to function. And right now, the profession of teaching is really in a crack, and they can't get out. So that, I think that's why it's not better. Elena? Well, I want to point out that, first of all, we are almost alone in the world where we attempt to educate all children. And our public schools have now more first-generation kids, more poor kids, more minority kids, and they historically don't do as well. We've typically blamed the kids that they came out of a poor environment, their parents didn't do well with them. But we're now learning that really effective teachers can make a difference. And there's a, a charter school movement that is blooming in this country. And you have the KIPP schools, you have citizen schools, which brings in volunteers who work with kids in the afternoons. Uh, in China and India, where and the, they're the countries that are outscoring us in math and science, they, their kids spend a lot longer time in school than our kids. So we've got to modernize and get in the 21st century, and I think teachers are getting the brunt here, but the days of a day, uh, when your work day ends at 3 and you have summers off, 
you know, those are coming to an end. The $787 bi uh, billion uh, stimulus, mm -hmm. a lot of that money goes to the teachers. Do you think Obama has bought off the teacher vote? No matter what he says by way of criticism, I, they're going to stay with him? I will tell you something. I think that the Obama administration deserves a lot of credit for the educational reforms that they've put in place, namely this Race to the Top initiative. What they did was introduce free market principles into education. All the states could compete for over $3 billion that they set out out there they would have to compete in terms of showing student outcomes better student outcomes and all of these states we've got over three dozen states that are challenging each other challenging the students challenging the teachers to increase um, student productivity and and uh, student outcomes and what's amazing about this is that it's actually working in the state of New York there were some Democrats aligned with the teachers unions who wanted to block upping the number of charter schools which have shown incredible progress in fact two weeks ago the Harlem Village Academies, charter schools in Harlem, New York, had 100% of these minority kids passing math, science, social studies. And in the state of New York, the teachers unions and some Democrats who were defending the unions actually backed down and allowed the state to up the number of charter schools from 200 to 460 to benefit mostly the inner cities, that El, uh, students that Eleanor was pointing out, minority students. Minority parents want their kids to have the best education possible. When you have the growth of charter schools like this, they have a real opportunity. And I want to give the Obama team a lot of credit for this because I think they are doing the right thing by introducing these kinds of market principles into education. You know when uh, Obama mentioned uh, charter schools in his speech. He was booed by the NEA. Yeah, and I think that he has shown some great political courage in standing up to the NEA, the National Education Association, and the AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, the two big teachers unions. He has stood up to them. He's made some concessions, but by and large, if he can hold the line, education, I think, will be one you of his great that, legacies. You think the union's biggest concern is the diversion of dollars to, to teacher to, schools that's not, not going to, to this? Well, look, one of the reasons why charter schools have been so productive in getting these great student outcomes is because they're not tied down by union rules or bureaucratic mandates. Well, that's not and the, entirely the teachers true. unions that's don't want men, to give men, up that control. Men, uh, many of the charter schools are under the public schools and they are unionized. Clarence, can you speak to this? Most and of, also, most John, I can not only speak to this, talk about but, but I, hate to, I hate to interrupt Chicago. Monica with all the good feelings right. she's exactly. <laughs> pouring forth for the Obama administration <laughs> and their uh, reforms here. <laughs> and I, I also agree with her about charter schools. They show tremendous mm -hmm. promise indeed there is a diversity of charter schools, a right. diversity of cities and circumstances, etc. I just had the pleasure of interviewing Bill Gates this week. There was a charter school convention uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, he's, he's given millions. And I'll tell you, you know what the problem with charter schools is? It's easier to open a new one than to close a bad one. Where did you, you know, in order to have, well, have real competition yeah. and market and all, uh, you know, a school is a school. People hate to see their where school did, close even Gates, if it's a bad school. Where did Gates go to school? Uh, he went to school in Seattle, it's where he grew public up, and, and he dropped out of Harvard Did because Harvard was school? too slow for him. Public school? <laughs> I, well, whatever, boy, works, not, whatever. I'm not next to this school. Right? I think. Right? I think he, well, well, this is a point, though, John. You know, you know, when you make uh, broad statements about schools, remember we got a double-tiered school system in this country. Some schools are in good neighborhoods. You know, when you buy your house, you buy your school. I, as far as I know, the Gates has had good schools in their neighborhood. But, but what we're really talking about are the failing okay. schools, and those are in the low-income areas Arnie, where kids need it the most. Arnie Duncan, who's the Secretary of Education. Where is he and from? He's, He's from Chicago. What did you do there? He was Park, the uh, education superintendent right. there. Right. Is he feeding these ideas to he, Obama? These, these are his ideas, yes. And, Namely, and the he, teachers are deficient. No, he is pushing <laughs> against the teachers, but he's also championing the teachers. He's not He's what not you, these, blaming these, all the teachers. Not, he's trying yeah. to put in this, systems this where you can Obama, weed out teachers. Obama are not a, leveled a big knock at teachers, and he says, John, if the John, students are not doing well, it's the teachers' fault. John, I know. the teachers' fault? I know. I know as a that, former John. teacher where your sympathies are, <laughs> and I understand that. I've got a lot of teachers in my family, but you know, uh, Obama's not out knocking teachers. Obama's standing up for parents, standing up for communities. The teachers union, their job is to stand up for teachers, and they do that job and very well. Uh, 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 We've got to have kids who, who come to school ready to learn Obama as well. The per pupil average for public elementary and secondary education is $10,844 per pupil. That's right. What do you think of that? Well, and it gets higher, the worse your school district is, the more expensive it is. Uh, you will see in places like the District of Columbia that the numbers get up to sixteen and $17,000. The places with the worst, most failing schools are the most expensive. Now, 
I'm not saying that there is a causal relationship between spending money and having kids do poorly in school. But what I will say is that things like the $23 billion, 23 billion American dollars that President Obama is demanding be put into what? paying for school right. salaries isn't oh, going to make okay. education. All right, since you're so, wait a minute, since you're so smart, can you speak about the fact that <laughs> American students score so poorly in relation to international students? Well, I think Eleanor had it right on the money. They prioritize and do different things. Two generations ago in the United States, JFK said, we have to do things differently because we're going to go to the moon. And then we did all the math and science, and we took this quantum leap forward. We're going to beat the Soviets and do all of this stuff. Right. Well, we don't have a mandate for kids now. What we do have are incremental mandates that every mm -hmm. six months, parents say, teach character or teach how to balance a checkbook or teach how to do something else. And guess what happens? Well, the decent liberal arts education is have, gone kaput. They have homogeneous populations in many of these uh, countries. And as I said, they don't attempt to educate everybody. We're taking also, it. they're We're all the ones that are tested are all college bound, whereas our students right. are not all college bound, and there's a terrific dropout rate right. with Latinos and blacks. But the District of comparing. Columbia, which has had uh, bad schools for quite a long time, has an activist mayor and mm -hmm. an activist school superintendent, and Adrian Fenty and and Michelle Ree. And I think eventually, that's our system is going to be one of the best in the nation. In, in New York when? City, in when? New York City, not well, maybe not your <laughs> lifetime, <laughs> <laughs> John. So, John <laughs> it's, okay. it's getting better already. But it's it's getting better it's internal. You mentioned Washington, D.C. When Michael Bloomberg became mayor eight years ago in New York City, he got mayoral control over the schools. Right. He's exerted enormous influence with Joel Klein, the school's chancellor. They've, they've done great things like What's Michelle Green in Washington, D.C. Last week, a court stepped in. The mayor wanted to close 19 failing schools in New York City. A court stepped in, backed by the unions, and said, no, you cannot do that. So I think what Obama's looking for and what Bloomberg and some of the no. mayors are looking for a greater, freer yeah, hand in stopping the use. Sometimes control. you yeah. can yeah. work it out. You started out schools. with the Rhode more Island school control. district. All those teachers were rehired with new contracts where they have to mm -hmm. work longer hours. So, you know, schools can well, be made better short of shutting the them down. The teachers are now in remedial education. Well, Question. Some of them assign, <laughs> assign a letter grade, A to F, to America's public school system. Chris. C. 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 They're A plus excellent in suburban wealthy districts. Well, just give me an overall and they're, and they're, What's the overall and grade? And they're C in, in, uh, in many Where, how districts. Does it, is that to be average now? Yeah, you, you do the math. <laughs> <laughs> I went to public schools. I can't do the math. A there, C and a what? I, well, a I would B give plus? it about a C, C plus because there are some extraordinary public schools There's out there. Great, great mm -hmm. public. I'm a pro product of a public education. I received a great public you education go to in New Jersey. Um, so there are some extraordinary teachers out there as well. It's just about local control and being able to root out failing teachers so, so this, that the kids can but thrive. But the, the broad consideration here is not a bum rap, is it, against yeah. teachers? This is a fair rap. No, it's a bum. Oh. No, it's a fair rap. It's a fair. And why it's is a fair, it a fair, it's, it's a fair, it a fair rap, rap against teachers' unions that are stopping some real progress here? Well. It's not fair to overgeneralize. This is the right. problem because we have a, a very diverse country and, and, and diverse schools. But as long as we, uh, you know, as long as we got a system where, where you buy your house when you buy your school uh, and vice versa, it's going to flunk as far as I'm personally concerned. But teachers have historically like a, been. This sounds like a big white boy. Teachers have I historically been. <laughs> I will well. give them a B plus. <laughs> Issue two BP on flowing. There are two relief wells in progress right now. Two relief wells. They may be the last best hope of stopping the BP oil gusher that has pumped into the Gulf of Mexico well over 130 million gallons of oil. Meanwhile, BP is paying out claims to Gulf residents who have lost wages and property. They're fishermen, they're shrimpers, they're laborers, they're deckhands, they're people who work in restaurants. These are the people of the Gulf Coast who need our help. BP has got to make things right, and that's why we're here. About $150 million had been paid out by BP for damages and lost wages. These wage payments, by the way, are subject to standard income tax, just as though they were standard wages. The IRS so announced last month. Analysts say that the federal government has no right to tax these income payments because the U.S. government's Minerals Management Service, MMS, authorized the construction of the pipeline to a record-breaking one mile below sea level. Question, can you make the case that the MMS approval of the BP well moves responsibility for the spill in part 
to the federal government and therefore the BP adjustment payouts to affected parties should not be taxed. Ellen Cliff. No, John, because even if you follow your line of thinking, the plans that BP presented to MMS, which showed how they could protect walruses in the Gulf, did not have a credible plan for cleanup, so they got the contract under false assurances. And when fraud is committed, a contract is invalid. So if you want to take your line of thinking, you can also invalidate it that way. And there's no way that, that BP is going to be absolved of responsibility because the government. Mm -hmm. No, but, but okay. nobody, nobody is making the that thrilling. argument. The argument is, and the investigation is ongoing, but the MMS, which is now has been renamed something else, some, ocean, some garbled, ocean energy. Some garbled ocean thing. Energy. Um, it, we do know that a couple of months before the oil well blew up, the MMS had given BP waivers, right. environmental sure. and safety waivers on that particular well. So we'll see what the investigation holds. But look, we've got a government so in Washington. The what's your view? Well, we've what's got a view? government in Washington that taxes everything that moves. So the people should not be shocked that the IRS wants their money for lost wages. That's is what there, we're talking about because they would have been earning this income. Yeah, is there in any abundant event. policy precedent for not taxing the BP payout to so no. the ones who are no, receiving I, it? No, because no, it's not a settlement. No. If, if there is a trade policy, and there is, and there is precedent for this, a trade policy that affects individuals through the corporations or howsoever, the, the Internal Revenue Service does not tax that individual. Right. Because there is the component of it being federal policy. Now, clearly, the federal policy of MMS provides that kind of cover. We're so far through the looking glass on this. There is no precedent because you have people who have been put out of work by a drilling moratorium that was entered by the Obama administration as a response to something that British Petroleum did in the Gulf of Mexico with the uh, say-so of MMS. But you can't, I mean, that's not a liability question. The question, though, is these people are getting money that would have been a wage. These people mm -hmm. are getting replacement right. wages. It must be yeah. taxed. Yeah, they're, right. they're entitled but we're to making up have the rules, their lost so wages reimbursed, but they're not uh, entitled to a tax-free windfall. So, I mean, I, 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 if, if we're going to talk about not taxing oh, people, I, I, would look at the, I would look at the people serving in Iraq mm. and Afghanistan. They pay yeah. taxes well, on their military. This show is taking a, the the show is taken a the cruel law. turn. I expect you to redeem it. It's well, no, it's just uh, um, the fact that these no. are democratically decided. You know, Congress can, um, has written the law. They can change the law if they want to. But I don't think they want to go down that road because you're right. I mean, there's so many ancillary victims in this circumstance. You know, how about the local burger franchises right. whose businesses went down? as a result of this whole disaster. So they could be the tax fishermen. exempt too. Yeah. I mean, it just goes on and on. Are the, are the losses incurred during a hurricane uh, compensated for by non-taxation of costs involved in repairing uh, and rehabilitating the uh, Domicile. If you have insurance, oh. that's <laughs> what insurance is for. Thank you. Thank you for grabbing that on our Sarah's Grizzlies. Say it doesn't matter who is right, it matters what is right. And what is right is these Mama Grizzlies message. Mama Grizzlies, says Sarah. Mama Grizzlies. That's Palin speak for what she sees as a new breed of female politician. Very conservative and also pro-life. Governor Palin sees the Mama Grizzlies as a trend in American politics this election season. Two Mama Grizzlies won their governorship primaries, and two Mama Grizzlies won their Senate primaries. Four Grizzlies. They are gubernatorial candidate Nikki Haley of South Carolina and gubernatorial candidate Susanna Martinez of New Mexico, plus Senate candidate Sharon Angle of Nevada and Senate candidate Carly Fiorina of California. These four women will officially stand for the Republican Party in the U.S. midterm election, November 3rd, Tuesday. All four women are ardently conservative, ardently pro-lifers, and they are all ardent feminists. This phenomenon demonstrates the fundamental shift in American feminism. Namely, women can be feminist and be either pro-choice or pro-life. Quote, Earlier feminists were almost universally pro-choice and have dominated political debate until now. Access to abortion was viewed as the only way women could have full equality with men. We now see women who have managed to gain equality with men while raising children. So says syndicated columnist Kathleen Parker. 
Is it feminism to be able to decouple reproductive rights from economic rights? Uh, well, I think times have changed, and I'm pleased that uh, pro-life conservatives are adopting the term feminism. They used to uh, demonize it. And uh, today, there are so many ways to avoid pregnancy, and, and, and abortion is safe, legal, and rare, which is what it should be. I wonder if these women are going to stop short of wanting to criminalize the procedure, wanting to overturn Roe v. Wade. I think that is going to be the dividing line. But I must say these mama grizzlies are a lot of fun. Sharon Angle <laughs> says that she doesn't believe uh, that the Constitution says church and state should be separated. She says Thomas Jefferson was misquoted, just like she <laughs> was. The, the ostensible <laughs> objective of first wave feminism was to liberate women so that they could choose right. which path they wanted to, to take in life, whether right. they want professional, a professional career, whether they wanted to stay home and raise a family, mm -hmm. and that they wanted American society to be non-judgmental about those choices. And I think those four women you put up there, from Sarah Palin to Nikki Haley, they epitomize feminism's achievement because these women have taken, in fact, all paths and made yeah. a huge success out of all of well, them. Well, the choice is really not profession or stay at home. There are lots right. of it variations, and lots that, of variations that within oh, that. that. Was my point we'll leave this Sarah up to Palin. the future. Issue four, summertime blues. Sometimes I wonder what I'm gonna do, but there ain't no cure for the summertime blues. I'm hoping and I'm praying I really need a job this summer. I'll contact you later if I need you, and I just never got a call. Summertime blues. That's what a lot of teens are feeling. The blues, no work. Teenagers are experiencing one of the worst summer employment situations in 80 years since the Great Depression. The unemployment rate for teens this summer is 27%. That's about three times worse than the overall U.S. unemployment rate. 1.6 million teens this summer are looking for work and can't find it. Factors behind the high teen unemployment include 1. State and local budget cuts. 46 states face budget deficits totaling $112 billion, and new jobs for teens are the first to go. Two, stimulus funding gone. The $787 billion stimulus package will soon be exhausted, meaning employers have no economic cushion to pay for summer hires. Three, competition. A recession-plagued economy with few jobs forces new college grads to grab what's there. That shuts out teens. Four, minimum wage increased from $5.15 an hour in 07 to $7.25 in 09. This increased burden on employers squeezes their ability to hire, so teens are pushed to the back of the line. Five, immigrants. In the 10 occupations employing the most U.S. teens, about one in five workers is an immigrant. Question, are teenagers bearing the brunt of this recession? I ask you, uh, Monica. Well, there are a number of groups that are disproportionately bearing the brunt of, of the unemployment crisis in this country. African Americans, men, and also teenagers. And teenagers are really at the bottom of the uh, totem pole when it comes to jobs because we have this 10% formal uh, unemployment rate, 20% total unemployment rate when you factor in everybody who has stopped looking for a job or people who are only working part-time who want full-time work. So teenagers are the last uh, layer that people would go to to actually uh, to hire somebody and put them in. In, uh, in, in a job and teenagers are really suffering. They need money for school, they need money for, for bare necessities and they are not being hired. Should well, Congress roll back the minimum wage? Clarence. I don't think that'll do it alone, John, because uh, the real minimum wage in recent years has often been higher than the that, than the legal minimum wage. Uh, the thing is, uh, uh, though, it, it is true that that there's been, been a kind of reverse trickle down effect, if you will. The other day, I, I pulled into a uh, drive-in uh, uh, sandwich shop whose initials are McDonald's, and uh, the guy <laughs> the guy recognized me from television because he's a Capitol Hill aide mm -hmm, working part time yeah. at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, this is what you're saying. So, so that, that pushes teenagers yeah. mm -hmm. farther out right. on the he street. He didn't confuse McDonald's. With McLaughlin, didn't he? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all, John. And he did, respects you greatly. This, was this what the president uh, had uh, a hamburger or whatever? No. With Medvedev? This, this, this was a cheaper hamburger place than that. Uh, the people's I'm hamburger. Not a, not the people's, people's hamburger. hamburger. The people's hamburger. That's, right. That's right. Well, work, work is undergoing a transformation, and a lot of the jobs that uh, used to exist for adults and for young people are not, so not there to worry. anymore. Not to worry. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not worrying. I think it's, but I think the message that young people have to take is 
is that education is really important. If you look at the unemployment figures for people who have a college degree, they're much uh, lower than people with only a high school degree. So I think the message has got to be to young people that they've got to chart a course that includes education. But and they've the, got to get creative about what they do in the summer. If the economy time. stays like this, though, the problem for these kids isn't just going to be that they can't get a summer job. It's going to be that they're going to lose a decade of their earning potential. We've seen these millennial kids who have come out feeling like they own the world, very entitled during the boom years of the past decade when things were good they get what they want and they do what they want these kids that are going to come out of col that are going into college and going to come out of college now they're going to be way behind and the jobs that they're going to have to take are going to be much less than the kids who were being able to click and dot com their way into right turn out yeah. and vote and, and right. also so i think they'll they'll be far less equipped for a sophisticated Just economy so. um, that that we have here in the united states because they're going to lose those apprenticeships right. you know the low paying jobs that you what have in do. high school and in college and you realize how the real world works and what a paycheck is really worth and you see that the government and takes half of it uh, all of those are life lessons that these kids are losing i certainly did john some of us sat down <laughs> as my as my millennial child has heard many times <laughs> 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 that's I'm, very, very they're, important they're, that they do oh that oh yeah, yeah. They're, 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 they're you know, there are consequences of uh, not getting a job there yeah. are oh, lots yeah. of all interns in washington what's that again there are lots of interns in washington Washington and they either live on subsistence wages right. or they don't get paid so at all. So our consciences can so, be clear. No, I mean, it's not going to be as gloomy as everybody else on the set. I think young people are going to do fine. Prediction, Chris. Bill Clinton will accidentally say something critical about Barack Obama's economic policies. Eleanor. Uh, evidence of the D.C. school system on the rise. Applications to be teachers in the system have gone up tenfold, 100 applications a day. That's a fact. That's not a prediction. Well, it's good enough for a <laughs> well, I was getting in what I didn't say earlier. Appreciation of standards <laughs> know, also, quickly. Um, President Obama will not close Guantanamo Bay. I'm go oh. Ever? <laughs> not in his first term. Yeah. Quickly. We're not going to begin the pullout uh, from Iraq on time either. Arizona's or law on immigration will be mimicked by seven other states but before Christmas. Don't forget to friend us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Bye-bye. Investing takes perspective. It comes from navigating up and down markets for 60 years spotting opportunities at home and abroad. Global Investing from Franklin Templeton Investments. Gain from our perspective.